Hi everyone, I'm Eric Enquist, Senior Managing Editor of The Real Deal. I'm here today with Representative Richie Torres of the Bronx, the Congressman who represents the 15th District, and we're going to talk politics and real estate. Welcome Richie. It's an honor to be here. Well, thanks for coming. I know, I don't know how much time you spend in Washington these days, but I remember you from the City Council, yeah. and coming up you were a candidate for Speaker. Tell us a little bit about your career and how you got to this point. I have a, an unusual journey to public office. So the, the starting point is the Bronx. I spent mm -hmm. almost all my life in the Bronx, uh, spent most of my life in poverty, was raised by a single mother who had to raise three of us on minimum wage, which in the 1990s was $4.25 an hour. And the single most formative experience of my life was growing up in public housing, mm -hmm. living in conditions of mold and mildew, leaks and lead, without consistent heat and hot water in the winter. Uh, that's, that experience is what inspired me to get my start in politics as a housing organizer. Mm -hmm. And then at age 24, I eventually took the leap of faith and ran for public office. I had no deep pocket, no ties to the dynasties of Bronx politics. But I was young and energetic, and I spent a whole year knocking on doors. I went into people's homes, I heard their stories, and I ultimately won my first campaign on the strength of door-to-door -door campaigning. And in the city council, I was a leading advocate for public housing. But I came to realize there was a limit to what I could do at the local level. You know, much of what we do locally is essentially the administration of federal programs and priorities. And so in order to have a systemic impact in improving people's lives, I felt I had to be in Washington, D.C., because that's where the rules are set, that's where the purse strings are held, that's where the future of the country is largely determined. And so for me, Congress was a logical progression from the New York City Council. Now, real estate is largely determined by local rules, but there are quite a few federal policies, not to mention budgets, yeah. that affect the industry. So we're going to talk about some of those today, but I do want to start with public housing because that's one of your priorities in Washington. And tell us you know, what, what you're doing, um, because public housing is widely regarded as in trouble yeah. um, in New York City and elsewhere. In some cities, it has been raised because no one could figure out how to fix it. Yeah. So what is your solution? The state of public housing in New York City is demolition by neglect. Um, you know, the New York City Housing Authority is arguably the worst landlord in the United States, uh, but it's too big to fail. It's the largest provider of deeply affordable housing, not only in the city, but in the country. And it's been so savagely underfunded that it has a capital need of $40 billion and counting. So you have children who have been poisoned by lead. You have senior citizens who, during the cold of winter, are freezing in their homes with their boilers breaking down. You have disabled residents who are stranded in their top floor apartments with their elevators breaking down. You have asthmatics who are struggling to breathe in the face of molded leaking conditions. So I see these living conditions as a humanitarian crisis and addressing them will require tens of billions of dollars in federal investment. I'm hopeful, cautiously hopeful, that the larger infrastructure bill could represent a historic opportunity to revitalize and preserve public housing in New York City. But do you really expect money is going to solve this problem? I mean, obviously, money is yeah. an issue. Uh, the, the authority doesn't have enough funding to do the $40 yeah. billion in cap. But a lot of things you mentioned were a function of terrible management. Look, right? there's no, as you know, I was the public housing chair in, New York, in, the, in the city council for, for seven years. And so no elected official did more to shine a spotlight on the dysfunctional management in NYCHA mm -hmm. than I did. Having said that, you know, boilers and bricks and elevators and roofs do not replace themselves. It requires public investment. And NYCHA has objectively been starved of funding that it desperately needs to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, in the municipal shelter system, we have 50,000 people. If public housing were to disappear tomorrow, we would have hundreds of thousands of people overflowing the municipal shelter system. Most of the people who live in NYCHA could not would be homeless without it. Right, public housing is not going to disappear tomorrow. I guess the question is, if it had never existed in the first place, which is the case in many cities, where would we be? I mean, if you look around to other cities that don't have public housing, you know, their real estate industry, industry manages to house. I disagree population. with you. I think if you look, um, we are a model of multifamily housing development compared to a city like San Francisco, 
where low-income people of color largely live in homeless encampments rather than multifamily housing, right? You have so-called progressive cities like San Francisco that engage in exclusionary zoning that stifles multifamily housing development. Mm -hmm. And we actually st stifle development as well, not of course. as, not, not not to as this, badly yeah, as San Francisco. Yeah. There's always- It's someone, all relative. There's always someone yes, worse. Yes. But I, I do wonder um, you know, whether you know, it's a viable solution to fix public housing just by uh, throwing money at the problem. There has been um, a solution ad advanced by the de Blasio administration, previous yeah. the Bloomberg administration, that involves bringing in private management, not to own the properties, but to run them. And you know they basically borrow against future Section 8 and use the borrowed money to spruce up the developments and then manage it, and then they pay themselves yeah. back over time. Uh, by converting, you know, you're, you're referring to the eight. rental assistance demonstration, program. right? The yeah. RAD program, yes, and it has worked in the in the few developments yeah. where it's been done. And it's being expanded. Yeah. Um, why why wouldn't that? It, for me, it's not an either or pro proposition. It's it's both and. We have to invest in traditional public housing, but but as you might know, I was the first elected official to come out in favor of RAD, which converts traditional public housing into project based Section Eight. It enables NYCHA to enter into public private partnerships so that NYCHA can access not only public, but also private sources of financing, low-income housing tax credits, tax exempt bond financing. And it's, it's been a success in New York City. I mean, the first example of RAD, if I recall correctly, was Ocean Bay in Southeast Queens. Ocean Bay had been plagued by decades of disinvestment. And as a result of RAD, it received hundreds of millions of dollars in capital improvements. The residents there have seen a transformation of their living conditions. So RAD is part of the larger strategy for preserving public housing. But I, I don't see it as an either or proposition. And the idea of concentrating tens of thousands of low income people in one development, in many cases isolated because of the odd architecture of, of the layout of yeah. public housing, does that strike you as um, a, a hurdle for folks to overcome? I and mean, one of the reasons you're considered a political success is because you got out of public housing, that you managed to overcome growing up in public housing. I, I see it differently. I, I, I would, I mean, yes, I agree. The, 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 the research is crystal clear about the impact of racially concentrated poverty, so I take your point. But I, I would not be where I am today were it not for public housing and the stability it gave me and my family. If, if, if my family had been homeless, then there's no telling how my life would have played out. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm enormously grateful to be where I am, and my sense of gratitude comes from recognizing the contingency of life, that my life could have been different and it could have been much far worse mm -hmm. uh, without public housing. Speaking of homelessness, that's another one of the issues that you've made a priority in Washington. And your idea, correct me if I'm wrong, is to increase vouchers for people who are uh, enduring homelessness so that they'll be able to use them to rent apartments. Is that essentially what you're advancing? Yeah, so according to the Harvard Center on Joint Housing Studies, mm -hmm. uh, before COVID, there were about 37 million Americans who paid more than a third of income on rent. And 17 million paid more than half of their income on rent, putting them at heightened risk of homelessness. And I believe as a matter of principle that housing is a human right and the best, the policy that would best operationalize housing as a human right is housing vouchers for all, which would ensure that you pay no more than 30% of your income toward your rent. So every American struggling with homelessness or housing insecurity should have access to a voucher. And, and that to me would address one of the root causes of the affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, addressing the affordability crisis has two variables. We need greater public subsidy which would largely come from the federal government, but we also need greater housing supply, which has to come from local government, has mm -hmm. to come from land use reforms. Mm -hmm. We could talk about housing supply in a minute, but I don't want to lose the thought on vouchers because we have vouchers already in New York City and New York State. They both have voucher programs, maybe not as many as you want, but- It's it oversubscribed. Has, it, hasn't, it hasn't solved the problem. Um, well, people the, have- The a, demand is greater than the supply of vouchers. Well, not just that though, People who have the vouchers, who got them, have a very difficult time using them. Most people, it is true that they're a source of income discrimination, but most people who have vouchers are living in an affordable housing unit. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that vouchers present for landlords 
is a lot of red tape and bureaucracy that they do not have to deal with if a tenant applies without a voucher. I, I, the experiences vary. So what I've heard is there's far greater confidence in the federal voucher program than there is in the state and city because we know the federal program is going to be there for the long term. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that properties that had Section 8 were the mo among the most resilient during COVID because the, gov the federal government kept paying the rent mm -hmm. even when tenants couldn't. So uh, I think there are landlords who would speak favorably about their experiences with Section 8. Mm -hmm. There are probably some improvements that could be made in terms of, well, if you're a landlord and someone applies with a voucher, uh, that requires an inspection. So now the government is coming to visit your apartment. It, only something can go wrong during inspection, right? So either you can fail the inspection and yeah. then now you've wasted a month or two and your apartment has been empty, generating no income, you know, or uh, they find various things that are wrong and now you have to fix them. I mean, you, but you can understand you know, why, why many landlords are hesitant. And you know, secondly, you know, they, um, they immediately, the, you mentioned the discrimination problem. It is illegal to discriminate um, mm -hmm. based on income. So if someone has a voucher, you, you can't just hang up the phone, although that is often what happens. But how do you overcome those, those issues? Um, look, look and keep in mind there are not only tenant-based vouchers, there are also project-based vouchers. And project-based vouchers uh, not only ensure that the units are deeply affordable, but it actually facilitates the financing of these properties. Um, so I think the combination of project-based vouchers and tenant-based vouchers would bring us as close as we've ever been to addressing housing insecurity and homelessness. You know, about half of the household heads in the municipal shelter system are working people who simply cannot afford market rate rent. Mm -hmm. You know, in New York City, we not only have the working poor, we have the working homeless. And I think if you're working hard and you're playing by the rules, then you should have a fighting chance at a decent and dignified life. And that starts with affordable housing. So there are quite a few cities that manage to supply affordable housing without any special programs. You know, I'll run through, so we ran a story six days ago that noted in Pittsburgh, if you make a little more than $40,000 a year, or actually a little less than 40000 you can afford to buy a median priced home. And in fact, there are 10 cities, major cities in the country where if you have an income less than 50000 you can buy a median priced home in that city. And these are not sp small places. This is Cleveland, Louisville, you know, Memphis, um, you know, Indianapolis. I mean, these are cities. Isn't that like apples and our, I mean, the cost of living varies widely. The cost of living in New York City is among the highest. And because of the housing but, is so but, expensive. But, but I think the constituency, everything is so expensive. But for me, I, I'm talking about housing for the essential workforce. You know, during COVID-19, we saw essential workers in places like the South Bronx put their lives at risk in order to keep the city afloat. And we owe it to those essential workers to give them a, a decent, safe, affordable place to live. Understood. But what do you think we are doing wrong or San Francisco is doing wrong as a city that causes our housing costs to be so high? I mean, that's one of the reasons, the main reason the cost of living Artificially is Artificially restricting the housing supply will raise the cost of housing. And I mean, part of it is we have cumbersome public review processes that can be weaponized by NIMBYs against multifamily development. You know, the cost of construction in the United States in general and in New York City in particular is prohibitively expensive. And it's partly a function of exclusionary zoning and partly a function of, you know, bureaucratic red tape and, and a cumbersome public review process. Now, you were in the city council, so yeah. you, you experienced this process. Yeah. Explain to us how, you know, the NIMBYs you mentioned, how it manifests itself politically that, you know, ends up in restrictive housing policy. Look, there's a fiction that the public review process is democratic, right? It gives the people a voice. What you find is it, it, it tends to be a, a visible vocal few and often a moneyed few who are able to exploit that process to their own advantage mm -hmm. and, and prevent multifamily housing in their backyards in order to protect quality of life or neighborhood character or whatever code word um, is used. Th that's been my experience with uh, the public review process. It's often been a stumbling block to affordable housing development. And the reality is we cannot address the affordability crisis without bridging the gap between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. You know, subsidy will only take you so far without sufficient supply. 
But at the end of the day, it is the politicians who are making the decisions. And people show up with pitchforks and say, I don't want apartments in my you know, single family community. Um, and, but you know, the people with the pitchforks are not voting. They're not making the decisions. Elected officials are making this. So put yourself in the position of an elected official. What do you do in that? So what, what do your colleagues do in those circumstances generally? Do they fold? We should do the right thing. And there ought to be a, a, a truncated public review process for affordable housing, given the emergency, the housing emergency in which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ironically, it's actually worse in the suburbs um, than it is in New York City. In yeah. fact, New York City now affordable housing um, is is a way to get your project through because it has so much political support um, in the city council in most districts whereas in most of the country it's the other way around like you just mentioned apartment buildings and people yeah. like no you know that's going to bring crime that's going to bring traffic uh, you hear all kinds of you know, not so subtly racist comments about what apartments would bring and from, you sense from, that? from self proclaimed progressives yeah, well, you know what, it's not, it's a nonpartisan issue, yeah. really. Democrats, Republicans, independents alike all seem to have the same reaction when it comes to real estate proposals in their neighborhood. But you find that some of the most progressive cities like San Francisco often have the most exclusionary, one could say systemically racist, zoning and housing policies. Right. And, and, and that, that hypocrisy, that cognitive dissonance, that, that that, that really gets this critical scrutiny that it deserves. Yeah, San Francisco is the poster child, yeah. um, but it's not the only one. No. Um, let's talk a little bit about SALT. SALT is state and local tax. It's the acronym that we all came to know and love a few years ago when the Republican tax reform of 2017, late 2017, w wiped away the yeah. deduction that people can take uh, on their federal taxes for state and local income taxes uh, and property taxes that they pay. That was especially pronounced in places like New York, New Jersey, California, where we have high local taxes. And you, so you were getting that deduction every year on your federal return and suddenly that was wiped out. You're trying to bring that deduction back. Yeah. Why is that? Restoring the SALT deductibility is critical to the budgets of both New York City and New York State. You know, I'm in favor of a more progressive tax structure for the sake of building a social safety net, but if we were to raise taxes without restoring SALT deductibility, uh, then that's the equivalent of writing a check to Ron DeSantis. Like there, there's a, I think the risk of an exodus is real in a world without SALT deductibility. Well, we did not have this massive exodus that some people predicted when the SALT deduction was removed. I mean, there's no question that it did change the flow of money from blue states to red states, it accelerated, you know, yeah. it was already in imbalance. But the fact is, if you were to restore the SALT deduction, the vast majority of the tax benefit would go to wealthy people. I mean, what's a good Democrat like you giving a tax break to wealthy people of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, well, there are, Massachusetts? There are middle class people who pay, uh, who also would benefit from the deduction. But whether you're wealthy or middle class, you're paying local and state taxes. Those taxes largely fund public services and the social safety net that benefits constituents like mine. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not mutually exclusive. Um, supporting the restoration of SALT will ultimately benefit my constituents who depend on the services provided by local and state government. And what are the political chances of actually... I mean, that's why I recognize the centrality of the real estate industry to New York City, because half of New York City's budget comes from the real estate industry. And you're actually one of the few uh, elected officials in New York City who does that because the real estate industry does have a reputation uh, as evil for many New Yorkers, uh, you know, true or not. And so you see a lot of reflexive opposition to real estate from elected officials. You know, many of your colleagues don't take money from real estate. They don't take any real estate contributions and often they reflexively oppose whatever development is proposed. Like what? What caused you to carve a different path from that? I never jump on the bandwagon. I think independently. Um, if you are an unscrupulous actor in the real estate industry, you should be held accountable. Uh, but the notion of indiscriminately demonizing a whole industry, regardless of the individual actors, mm. uh, strikes me as absurd. Mm.
Let's talk about, um, there, there's a bill, and this, this is a local bill. Now, I know you, know, you represent a congressional district now, um, but there's a local bill that would prevent uh, landlords from doing criminal background checks on apartment applicants. You, I think you were a sponsor of a similar bill in the city council that uh, disallowed criminal background checks for job applicants. Um, and there are various ban, you know, ban the yeah. box legislation yeah. in, in states and cities across the country. What would be your feeling about um, not allowing landlords to check criminal history of people who apply for their apartments? Yeah. So I, I would have to re review the legislation before passing a final judgment, but here's my initial thought, and, and I'll answer your question by way of a story. When I was in my early teenage years, um, I paid a visit to two of my half-brothers who were in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a federal prison in New Jersey. And I remember asking one of them, you know, and I only met them once, but I asked one of them, you know, what do you plan to do when you're no longer in prison? And he said, if I can't find a job or can't go to school, then I'm simply going to go back to the same life I had before. Mm -hmm. And so from that encounter, I realized early on that we have a fundamentally punitive rather than rehabilitative criminal justice system. We often set up the formerly incarcerated for failure. You know, if you deprive people of housing and education and employment, then how can you reasonably expect them to rehabilitate themselves? Uh, and, and so I, I don't know the details of the legislation, but, but I support the goal itself is laudable, the goal of ensuring greater access. You know, the numbers I've seen suggest that the formerly incarcerated are 10 times more likely to be homeless mm -hmm. uh, than the general population. And in what sense is that conducive to rehabilitation? Mm -hmm. There's no question that the criminal justice system is flawed, you know, so deeply and fundamentally flawed that it really has to be rebuilt from the ground up. Um, and there have been some efforts to do that, at least to start. There has been a turnaround from the, the days of the 1990s when it was all punitive, 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 we'll just solve it by punishing people. So that has been an improvement. But with respect to these, these bills that limit what landlords can check, I mean, of course, it actually sounds like a great idea to not allow someone to check criminal history because um, if they do, then you know, anyone who has a criminal history tends not to get the apartment, right? That's what they're checking for, right? If they didn't care, they wouldn't check. But if they're checking, you know, that tells you the landlord is probably not going to give that person the apartment. So that's going to be a strike against that person. And there's actually nothing more important than, than housing in terms of your ability to turn your life around yeah. and live a successful life. Like if you want to break addiction, you know, improve your employment, education, like all of those things yep. really stem fundamentally from your housing situation. Yes. So I understand the importance of that. The problem with these banned check bills is that l landlords, so you know, let's say you were to show up and apply for an apartment and the, the landlord can't check your history. And he might notice that you have a gap in your rental history. I mean, he might ask, you know, what, what were you doing during that time, you know, where I don't, you don't seem to have lived anywhere. And the suspicion is that the person might have been in prison, especially, and people tend to make these, leap to these conclusions about young black men. And they are the ones who have the hardest time getting apartments or getting jobs when they have no criminal background history, but the employer cannot check or the landlord cannot check because they, they automatically make an assumption that this person might have been a criminal and then give the apartment to someone else. I mean, that is a very difficult problem to solve. But I, I don't suspect that many politicians even think about that. Look, when I approach legislation, the, the three questions I ask myself is, A, is it legal? B, is it workable? And C, is it going to have unintended consequences? Do the benefits outweigh the costs or do the costs outweigh the benefits? You know, I'm a pragmatist for whom the most important value is balance. And so there's a balance to be struck between public safety and criminal justice reform? You know, the, the question of is it legal, I think that's another good point you mentioned. I, the constitutionality of laws, I don't think that many elected officials really place a high priority on that. Their priority seems to be, let me pass something that is going to get me good press, votes, a good reputation, maybe some media interviews. 
And so, and that leads me to eviction policy. We, we did have a, a ban on evictions in New York, which was widely supported across mm -hmm. the political establishment. Tenants were allowed to simply check a box that says, I was um, financially disadvantaged by COVID. They were able to self-certify their status mm -hmm. and therefore their landlord could not evict them um, for many cases for more than a year. So the Supreme Court stepped in and said, that's not constitutional. You can't expect a private actor to convey a benefit to someone who's simply self-certifying. No, no man could be a judge in his own case. Was the, right. Yeah. So New York turned around and passed almost the same law. Not quite. That's not accurate. So my understanding is the Supreme Court struck down a provision, not the whole mm -hmm. state moratorium, but a provision of the moratorium providing for self-certification. Mm -hmm. So the, the state legislature updated the law to no longer allow for self-certification. You have to prove a financial hardship. Sort of. Uh, and now, and I, and I believe it now, you can evict people for reasons unrelated to COVID, for constituting a nuisance or for damaging property. So it's not as if the state legislature passed the same exact law. It's not exactly the same. It entitles landlords to challenge. Uh, and if the landlord- Which is different from self-certification. It's a little bit different. You know, the, the tenant essentially self-certifies, but then the landlord can challenge it and they would go to court and there would be a hearing. The tenant's advocates, tenant advocates say, well, that is a burden on the tenant. They have to prove once there's a hearing that they had a, had a hardship. But I, I, you know, the, the legislation was passed in a matter of days, literally like yeah. basically a day. So it struck me as like the eviction moratorium expired we have to do something right away yeah. before we start losing votes. I mean, that's a legitimate criticism. And look, there's a sense in which both tenants and landlords are victims of the incompetence of New York State. Mm -hmm. So the United States Congress appropriated two tranches of emergency rental assistance, $46.5 billion. Right? The first tranche dates back to December. The second tranche dates back to March. So December. By June, New York City had not distributed any funding. It was one of only two states that distributed no funding. By July, it distributed less than 1% of its funding. The city, uh, the and state. The state, mm -hmm. and, and as of August 31st, if I recall correctly, out of $2.7 billion, only 300 million has been spent. That's correct. 90% right? is unspent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, landlords who, continue have, who have to continue to pay sewer bills and, and property taxes and water bills are a victim of the incompetence of New York state government. Uh, the solution in my mind lies not in evicting tenants from their apartments who have genuinely suffered hardship, but it lies in expediting the flow of those emergency rental dollars mm -hmm. so that we can stabilize both tenants and landlords. Right, we, we've heard, I think that has been the feeling across the board and, and governor, the governor has expressed yeah. that. And so keep in mind that there are other states like Texas, Virginia, Washington DC, not a state, mm -hmm. that spent about half of their emergency rental assistance. Mm -hmm. Whereas we've spent barely, what, 10%. So there's no excuse for the ineptitude of, of New York state government. Let's talk about infrastructure. The Democrats are trying to pass two bills. Yeah. One is a trillion dollar bill, one is three and a half trillion. Yeah. Tell us what's going on with that. Uh, what are the politics, what are you trying to accomplish? There are two pieces of legislation. There's the bipartisan infrastructure framework, which represents traditional hard infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then there is the Build Back Better Act, right? The larger human social infrastructure bill, which could have a price tag as high as $3.5 trillion. Um, it's a priority for the president, for the majority leader, and for the speaker, and for most of the Democratic caucus, to advance both of those bills on two parallel tracks at the same time. There is some resistance, right? The, the Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are concerned about the price tag of the larger reconciliation bill. Um, and then there are a few Democrats in the House who, who might resist the, the reconciliation bill as well. My question is why, maybe this is kind of a naive question, but probably something that Ameri many Americans wonder, why can't you do a bipartisan bill? Look, the original strategy was to do both, to do both a bipartisan bill and the larger reconciliation bill. Mm -hmm. um, we would certainly welcome Republican support for the reconciliation bill. Um, 
But the reconciliation bill is too important to ignore. I mean, the reconciliation bill would include a restoration of SALT deductibility, which is critical to New York. It would include tens of billions of dollars in desperately needed funding for public housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it would include funding for long-term care, which matters to all of us who have aging parents, and we're going to be aging adults someday, where we're experiencing a, a gray tsunami. Uh, and it includes critical investments in climate change. I mean, New York City saw not one but two record rainfalls in the span of a week. I, I said to someone earlier, between the mass burials of COVID-19 and the almost apocalyptic flooding of Hurricane Ida, there's a sense in which I feel like I'm living through the apocalypse as a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. So some of the investments that are most critical in New York are in that reconciliation bill, and we have to pass it. One of the reasons that real estate wants infrastructure to pass is because obviously it enhances the value of your property. Yeah. The better your infrastructure is around your property, the more it's worth, the more rent you can charge. Uh, do, you, do you sense that there is any effective support from the industry for this bill? Or are you kind of on your own in Washington? My impression is the real estate industry wants to see a, rest a restoration of salt deductibility and certainly wants to see greater investments in affordable housing. And if, if, if we manage to pass the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, it would include about $37 million in funding for NYCHA, massive capital investments, which would be a boon to the real estate industry. And it would include nationally uh, about $95 billion for Section 8, which would translate into 1.1 million vouchers nationwide. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you represent the poorest district in the country? Yes. I remember your, your predecessor said that quite a bit, and he was in Congress for, for decades, which is a little depressing when you think about it, because you begin to wonder, is there any hope for, for the Bronx, for the South Bronx? Um, because it just seems such an endemic problem now. Like, what's the way out? It, there's certainly hope. I mean, yes. There are deep inequalities that have persisted, but we have come far. You know, we've overcome arson and abandonment in the 1970s. We overcame the crack epidemic of the 1980s. We overcame the crime wave of the 1990s. Uh, there's a wealth of, of, of development in the Bronx. Um, and I think we saw clearly during COVID-19 that the Bronx is the essential borough of New York City. It's home to the essential workers who kept our city operating in its moment of greatest need and greatest challenge. So uh, I, I am, my story is but one testimony mm -hmm. to the resourcefulness and resilience of the people of the Bronx. Richie Torres, we appreciate your coming into the Real Deals office and talking about all of these issues. And we wish you the best in Washington and the South Bronx. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Mm -hmm.